I do believe that we humans define ourselves by the stories we tell, and especially the stories we tell about ourselves. But what is true of humans is also true of nations. And I think we define ourselves as a nation by the stories we tell about ourselves and what we remember about ourselves. Our memories really define our values and they define the way we create a new nation as we go forward. Faulkner once said, the past is never dead. In fact, it's not even past. And that reminds me so much of what Ken Burns does. Even though I'm not American, I have always admired the work of Ken Burns and the way he captures American history. I believe his unique approach to still photography and the inclusion of individual stories bring history to life in a way that few others have matched. There are some who have criticized him for being sentimental and nostalgic, but I highly disagree with that. In fact, today I want to argue that Ken Burns' approach, despite his lack of formal education in history, actually has considerable academic validity and a tremendous public value for the present and the future. History tends to be something we take for granted, something we assume is just there for us to be accessed. But in academic circles there is much debate on the meaning of history and the extent to which we can attain it. This debate basically comes down to two competing research philosophies which can be referred to as naturalism and constructivism. In their book Ways of Knowing, Scandinavian professors Moses and Knudsen explore both of these and their implications for, among other things, historical research. Naturalism has its roots in the natural sciences, which assumes there is a world independent of the observer about which we can make objective, factual statements. When it comes to history, this approach seems straight as an arrow. Historians write stories backed by evidence, with evidence being preferably primary sources, the direct outcomes from historical events or experiences, such as eyewitness accounts and original documents. It can also include secondary sources, accounts based on primary sources such as newspaper stories and historical reports. Although these tend to become less trustworthy the further they are removed from the original event. The main issue with this approach is that the reliance on primary sources produces a very slanted view of history as it favors those who leave primary sources behind while marginalizing those who do not. Because of this, history as we know it is mostly a political history. After all, the accounts of kings, generals and political leaders were often much better preserved than those of the ordinary citizens. We can visualize this issue in a diagram representing the past, consisting of all events, all actions and all thoughts by all individuals. To begin a historical account, this past has to be observed by someone. The observed has to be remembered. The remembered has to be recorded. These records then have to stand the test of time and those that survived have to be deemed believable and usable. It is out of this small circle of available data then that the historian creates an account. It is because of these difficulties that constructivists are critical of the three basic assumptions of naturalist historians, which are there is a past that can be captured. There is available data that is objective and representative of that past, and this data is simply there for the taking. Constructivism draws more attention to the important role of the observer, the historian, because, as Edward Carr puts it in his book What is History, the belief in the hardcore of historical facts existing objectively and independently of the interpretation of the historian is a preposterous fallacy, but one which is very hard to eradicate. Constructivists recognize historical accounts as being inherently biased and are therefore not committed to finding one single truth, one definitive historical account. Instead they immerse themselves in a multitude of unique and individual histories and look for patterns that hold meaning for us in the present. Their search is therefore not so much about who we were, but more so about who we are, or rather, who we've always been. To answer it, they like to gather tons of information and create thick descriptions of the past to which they apply a narrative. In essence, this is where the historian becomes a storyteller, which is where we enter the domain of Ken Burns.
I'm curious with how my country ticks, how it works. I feel like a mechanic that lifts up the, the hood and looks in at the engine. And I'm interested in a true, honest, complicated past that is unafraid of controversy and tragedy, but equally drawn to those stories and moments that suggest an abiding faith in the human spirit. I believe that the work of Ken Burns falls in this constructivist philosophy of historical research. We can see this immediately when we look at the astounding length of his films, often running multiple hours long. Even his first film about the Brooklyn Bridge, which was envisioned as a short piece of maybe 10 minutes by everyone else, ended up being a feature-length film in the hands of Ken Burns. This, however, doesn't mean that his films lack focus. When we take a look at his 14-hour-long film The War, for example, there's an opening statement that recognizes the enormous scope of the Second World War and makes clear to the audience that the film is limited to the stories of four American towns. Very much in line with the constructivist philosophy, Ken Burns clearly doesn't aim for one definitive historical account and instead looks to find meaning in a variety of historical stories and individuals. I made the decision early on that I did not want to be a telephone book, an encyclopedia, a dictionary. I wanted to be a story, a narrative. So I knew that I would have to pick and choose several symbolic and emblematic stories and individuals and tell them well, rather than try to tell every story and end up telling none well. What probably stands out the most for me is his choice of what and whose stories to tell. The major upside of his focus on American history is that it is relatively new and the available primary sources are still abundant. Ken Burns seems to take advantage of this by using a bottom-up approach as opposed to a top-down one. This is not just a top-down uh, history. I mean, most people think American history is just a series of presidential administrations punctured by wars and, and that gives you a fairly you know I suppose superficial handle on things uh, but it's much more complicated than that and the bottom-up view that we've always tried to adopt uh, delivers you much more complexity and undertow one major benefit of his bottom-up approach is that it is inclusive of otherwise marginalized voices. Ken Burns' films often include stories that tend to go untold and are therefore vulnerable to get lost in time. As a consequence, we see a much more complicated vision of America, one that doesn't just celebrate its triumphs, but also reveals its mistakes and tragedies. This is clearly reflected by the issue of race, one of the major themes in a lot of his films, which according to Ken Burns is not necessarily something he looks for, but rather something he inevitably stumbles upon with this approach. What happens is, is we tend to say, oh, you're right, this is an important subject, and then accidentally resegregate the subject by treating it separately. Oh, let's just do black soldiers in America or in the Second World War. But you want to take African-American history, which is relegated to February, our shoulder, shortest and coldest month, and see it not as a politically correct addendum to our national narrative, but at the burning heart of it. Another benefit is that it creates what Ken Burns calls emotional archaeology, an exploration of the emotional driving forces that cement all the dry dates, facts and events together into something higher than the sum of its parts. In doing so, he doesn't only recount history, but also connects it to the present. The emotions that drove people in the past are, after all, the same emotions that drive us today. It is for this reason some critics mistake his approach for sentimentality and nostalgia, which he firmly believes it is not. Uh, sometimes people find the principal emotion of those higher emotions is love. And love is a very embarrassing and complicated word for a lot of people. Uh, but love is actually the ingredient of the universe. It's, the, it's the, the quantity that makes things work. So if you deal with love as I do, uh, as the ultimate theme underlying all stories, it's a form of communication but also of love, um, that can make some people pretty nervous. So how does Ken Burns present his stories? As a filmmaker, Ken Burns has the advantage of being able to employ a multitude of ways to articulate his historical accounts. 
the one thing he is probably most well known for, which is now referred to as the Ken Burns effect, is his innovative use of still photography. Instead of simply showing historical pictures, he approaches them as if they were any other scenes and uses them in such a way that he can deliberately direct the focus and information of the audience and bring the images to life. So I treat an old photograph the way a Hollywood a feature filmmaker would a wide shot with medium shot, close up, insert, pan, tilt, cutaway. All the possibilities of a dramatic film and shoot each image with that in mind. And not only do I see it, through the viewfinder, I listen to it. Are those soldiers' feet tromping? Are those cannon firing? Are the birds fluttering away as the battle begins? Is the bat on the baseball cracking? Is the crowd yelling? Uh, can you hear the, to uh, the trombone player uh, tuning up? What are the sounds of that old photograph? And so we have a complex, uh, dense uh, sound effects track, original music. The first person commentary of people of the times in diaries, journals, newspaper accounts, criticisms, love letters, all to make it come alive. And we hope a poetically written third person narration. And I think all of these things come together and create a moment where, as William Faulkner said, history is not was, but is. Let's look at a concrete example of how Ken Burns effectively combines multiple techniques for his emotional archaeology. In his film on the national parks, Ken Burns refers to the ancient monuments in Europe and points out how America, being a younger country, doesn't have such man-made landmarks, but it does have natural ones and they are one of America's strongest connections to the past. Their preservation allowed Americans of today to go into these places and behold the same views that once captivated Thomas Jefferson and countless other historical figures. To invoke this feeling of historical relevance, Ken Burns melts historical photographs and narration with an incredible amount of live photography to blur the lines between past and present. The tendency nowadays to wander in wilderness is delightful to see. Thousands of tired, nerve-shaken, over-civilized people are beginning to find out that going to the mountains is going home. That wildness is a necessity. And that mountain parks and reservations are useful, not only as fountains of timber and irrigating rivers, but as fountains of life. John Muir. In another example, a woman reads a letter she sent to her brother during the Second World War, while Ken Burns only shows us her face and his childhood footage. You said you sent home $30. We didn't receive it yet, but it will get here soon. Mama's going to put it in the bank for you, babe, so that when you come home, you can have everything you want. You can buy your car and all your new clothes. Well, babe, I guess I've said enough for now. Love from all. Take good care of yourself and write as often as you can. May God bless you and keep you safe. Our thoughts are always with you, your loving sister, Olga. Here, the tone of voice and visual contrast between past and present instinctively tells us her brother never made it home. Ken Burns' films are filled with stories like these that connect us to history in an emotional way and give us a deeper insight into the historical patterns that brought us to where we are now. In a sense, he is making the same film over and over again, each story a different expression of our unchanged being, our tendency for war and violence, our capacity for love and compassion. It's always been the same, and it always will be. Ecclesiastes says, what has been will be again, what has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. And what that says is that human nature never changes. It superimposes itself on the random chaos of events, which means you can apprehend, perceive patterns in history. And that makes it resonate with the past, uh, the present resonate with the past. 
It is this acknowledgement of the unchanging human condition which, in accordance with a constructivist approach towards history, leads us back to the artist or historian in the present, looking back not only to discover where we've been, but also where we are and where we're going. Oh, oh, the comrades at home.